Hey everybody, I hope you and your loved ones are safe, happy and healthy. Before you watch or listen to the show, make sure you are following us at My Legal Club on Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn to stay up to date with all our latest news, updates and content. If you or your family or your business need any legal support or solicitor quotes, remember to reach out to us at mylegalclub.co.uk. Stay well and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the MLC Show. I am your host, Sean Rogers, and I'm delighted to be joined on today's show by Steve Patterson, Director at Later Life Money. Steve is a lead in equity release broker and has been nominated for the Financial Times Equity Release Advisor of the Year on multiple occasions. Steve, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Sean. I'm great. Yeah, looking forward to uh, looking forward to Christmas now and just say thanks for giving the opportunity to speak with yourself. So good, all good. Yes. It's a pleasure to have you on with your experience and now on this area, you're going to be fantastic to pick your brains. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into all the questions. So first question I wanted to ask you before we get stuck into equity release was what's the best part of your job and what is the most challenging? Yeah, good questions. Um, I think the best part of my job is I, I love traveling different areas and I love the diversity of people I meet with clients, other business people. But one one week I could be in London or one day in London, two days later I could be, you know, as far as Aberdeen. And uh, but I love meeting different people. I love, you know, the clients, their experiences, and also the other business people I meet along the journey as well. So all good. Um, challenges. I guess the the thing that I personally find quite tough is maybe delivering bad news to clients. And by that, I mean, maybe we can't achieve the desired outcomes with the estate planning or equity release. Could be for a number of reasons. Um, but being a natural people pleaser, I find that part difficult to deliver that news. And, you know, and I'm working on it anyway. But that's the biggest challenge for me. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Like you want to it be... Is. You know, I can tell, and I know you as well. But sort of the passion to try and um, do a great job and meet clients' needs, if you will, then it's difficult going going back to them and delivering that news when you know it's it's you know you're desperate to get them that result, which is a real positive for you. But it's just not a nice experience, hasn't when that happens, especially when it's because of something outside of your control that you can't do anything about. Um, so I completely sympathise with that. I mean, getting stuck into the questions there are two different types of equity releases i understand that home reversion plan and lifetime mortgage options could you explain for us please what are the key differences between a lifetime mortgage and a home reversion plan and i was reading that lifetime mortgages are more popular what why is that um home reversion involves the sale of all or part of your home to the provider yeah, so you are relinquishing ownership of the home or at least a percentage of it, and that won't change. Um, to answer your question about why, you know, one's more popular than the other, and I'll cover off how a lifetime mortgage works because the that's the ones that, that, that I advise on, really, or mainly advise on. Um, but a home reversion plan, um, it means that, it, it, it could be very costly for the, the estate in, in simple terms in that once you've given away the home, if you like, or sold it, then you could, if you, if, if you passed away very quickly, the lender then owns your home. Yeah, there would be if it happened within six months or two years. So I guess that's why it's not as popular and you don't retain ownership of the home. Yeah. I think the last figures I looked at was less than 1% of the marketplace. So that'll give you an idea of the, the sort of um, the industry itself. A lifetime mortgage, on the other hand, um, it's similar to, I always describe it to clients as it's similar to an interest only mortgage where you borrow a certain amount based on your age and the value of your home. The lender will then charge an interest rate, which can either be rolled up or added to the um, the principal amount, if you like, the lender will get their money back in one of two events, either death or moving into long-term health care. So in other words, you wouldn't need the property again. But the big difference being here is that you still retain ownership of the home on that product. And once the lender's had their money back and any interest, if that's been added to the loan, the remainder 
of the property value, and that includes any increases, goes to your beneficiaries or is stayed as planned. Yeah. So hypothetically, you've got, for arguments, I've got a 200 grand property. Yeah. I'm looking to release £100,000. 99% of people will go down the lifetime mortgage route in that example. Mm -hmm. I, in essence, take a mortgage out for the 100 grand, which would pay off. If I'm mortgage free, that's what it is. If I owe 25 grand on my existing mortgage subject to early repayment charges and anything else, yeah. 100 grand would discharge any existing lender. So in essence, I've basically got, like you say, an interest only mortgage mm-hmm. for 100 grand on a 200 grand value property. And then when it comes to how much it costs me on a monthly basis, I'm either going to pay a monthly interest only amount or hypothetically the interest would be added on to the 100k lifetime mortgage, if you will. And then obviously that's then dealt with at the end. And I suppose the lender is taking, yeah. So the lender is taking a view in relation to loan to value. Is that fair? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that was a really good way to put it. And the other thing to add, you could pay the interest on a monthly basis, but also with almost all of the lifetime mortgage products now, you can make ad hoc payments. Um, so you could pay all of the interest, some of the capital, or a mixture really, depending on the lender and provider, depending on what the client is looking to do. Um and, you know, you could you can mix and match, basically. So pay the interest if you wish to keep the balance static, or you could make additional payments to that to even reduce the capital you've borrowed as well. There are some fantastic features and products available now linked to the lifetime mortgages. It's really good. So one of the most common questions which overlaps with what we were just discussing is, do I still own my own home and can I live in it for the remainder of my life? Yes, that's a good question. Um, With a home reversion plan, um, no, because you've given away, you've sold the home to a provider or sold at least a percentage of it to the provider. With a lifetime mortgage, then yes, you would still retain ownership of the home. You still own it. Um, Sorry, what was the last part you asked, Sean, there? Yeah, living in the home for the remainder of your life. That's one of the typical things. So if I do equity release, can I still live there for the rest of my life? Um, I assume probably what the question is leading to is, is there a situation where I'm almost kicked out or in essence not entitled to stay there anymore, whether it be, I suspect people are thinking there might be a a certain date or an end of a term, or there might be an event that means they can't live in the home any longer, but outside of their control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, good question. Um, With both products, you can, you know, you, you can remain in the property for life. Yeah, there's no end date, there's no term on it. You can remain in the property for life or until you move into the long-term healthcare. Um, The answer to your question on would there be an event that could trigger the sort of repossession, if you like, or whether the the client would have to move out if, you know, if something happened. I guess there's terms and conditions attached to every type of mortgage or Strictly speaking, a home reversion plan isn't a mortgage because you've sold the property, you know, it's different. But a lifetime mortgage, they'll all have terms and conditions in the offer. Um, But the benefits are you do have tenure for life with both products. I can give a quick example. Say if somebody decided they, they wanted to move out the property and rent it out, that would be a case where you've brought the terms and conditions of the offers in my experience. So the lender would then ask for their money back. The idea is that, it's your main residence remains, so you say. So there are certain terms and conditions. However, both products, you are given tenure for life in them. You could stay in that until the last person or survivor, if there's two people, passes away or moves into permanent health care. Brilliant. And it, touching on that, when... What, what are the types of defaults? I'm assuming just non-payment. And then in that, is it a normal sort of lender position where they might they might look to seek possession, as an example? Is there anything else that along those lines that could lead to possession or, or a default position? Mm, I guess um, when it comes to non-payment, that doesn't really apply to the lifetime mortgage or the equity release because the when we talked about making interest payments or even capital payments on a lifetime mortgage, it's an option, not an obligation. So even if there was no payments made at all, then 
that would not be a reason that the lender would want the funds back or the client would be repossessed. It's it, That's why this product is designed in that way. Um, in that particular scenario, the interest, instead of it being paid, it would just roll up, be added to the principal amount. And then again, the lender would want their money back when one of the two events we've mentioned earlier happens. So they would get the principal back plus the interest, but no payments have to be made. It's, it's, it's an option. Yeah. And is equity release regulated? What kind of safeguards are there? It is. It's it's any anyone advising any brokers or companies advising on equity release have to be regu- we're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, um, and also there's other bodies that are out there as well, such as the Equity Release Council, who we're members of. So we have to obviously stick to all the regulations and rules and all the changes that are involved. But in addition, um, there's some extra standards that we will also adhere to linked to the Equity Release Council. So we will go that extra mile. I suppose you could describe it as like a gold standard of advice. So we'll, we'll, we'll take it to that extra level. And to be fair, later like money, we only use lenders that are also stick to the Equity Release Council rules and guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, because it used to have a bad reputation equity release. Like as someone who's not not been in that sector and 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 not sort of worked in property or this mortgage sector for you know for as as a huge period of my career, I guess. Mm. Um, you know, as an outsider, if someone had mentioned that to me, I'd have been like, yeah, it kind of feels like it's got a bit of a bad reputation. Feels like it's 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 not littered or anything, but feels like there's the odd cowboy potentially from just the headlines that you see. I'm going back maybe ten years here in in, in that kind of thing. So, how how would you reassure someone or explain why things are different in 2021 to these kind of I don't know positions that some of us, even myself perhaps, have taken like ten years ago in terms of the sector? Yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's it, it's a good question and it, it, it does come up quite often where people need that reassurance and it has, it's there's still a stigma attached that, you know, to the, the actual product itself or the term equity release. I guess that's up to us within the industry now to turn that around, but I've come across products, some of the historic products that, yeah, I, I don't think they've been good products, you know, and I guess some have been badly advised that I've come across in the past as well, to be honest, Sean. And I think that's why it's important to use a firm or a broker that has, you know, good experience and current experience in the marketplace, without a doubt. But the traditional products didn't have a lot of the safeguards or the flexibility or the features built in that the new products have at the moment. Um, it's got to be right for the client. Even now, it's not right for every customer. And if it's not right for the customer, you you know, you, I would tell them that and explain why. Um, a lot of the historic products were on quite high interest rates. Some of them were on variable rates. So there's no actual outcome that can be predicted as to how much is going to be outstanding in the future. So there are lots of reasons why the new products now and the regulations that are in place um, are way better for the clients, way better. Yeah. I think that's great advice on the experience point because I think equity release, you know, is quite, for a, a mortgage broker point of view, it's quite an exciting area to maybe be in or move into. I think there's a lot more interest in people trying to move into that area. And I suppose for a potential client, you've got, you'd have to try and ask research review check you know is this someone inexperienced dabbling in the area which hopefully it wouldn't be i don't think there'd be many brokers so many brokers are so professional and great at what they do I, I doubt there'd be any but if there were any you'd want to avoid that and then like you say going to them people that are really experienced in the sector um and 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 do this 90 percent plus of their time that is different, isn't it, to someone who does all the areas and might get one case every six mm-hmm. months, as an example, compared to someone like yourself and your team who are, or, and others like you who are, mm-hmm. you know, absolutely like neck deep in it every day, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, this is all we do. We, I, I don't advise on um, residential ordinary mortgages and that. Now, I've done that in the past, but I think you've, you've brought up a really good point where um, I would always encourage 
any clients to check the FCA register, make sure that they're regulated and that they are um, authorised to give advice on equity release. But also I would ask the question, how long has the advisor been doing equity release? Um, lots of advisors have the exam, lots of mortgage advisors, but decide that they don't want to enter the field because it is changeable. It's a lot of responsibility. Um, and the, the products are constantly evolving and changing. So unless you're dealing with this regularly and all the time, as you mentioned earlier, it is very difficult to keep up to date with all of the products and providers out there. So I would say, you know, I wouldn't advise on um, residential mortgages, for example, anymore. We, we just want to specialise in this area so that we, you know, we know it inside and out. We can give good advice and we can, you know, we can ensure that the clients are getting the best outcomes rather than trying to wear too many hats, if you like, for want of a better term. Yeah. How much can you borrow on equity release, Steve? Um, really anything. For, typically, um, 10,000 is typically the minimum that you can borrow, but right up to, you can borrow millions, you know, right up to 10 million if the property itself um, has a high enough value and it fits criteria and depending on the age of the client as well. So it's always going to be uh, based on a percentage of loan to value, if you like. But the, the, um, the, you can learn vast amounts now. I'm not suggesting anybody does because you've got to have a good reason for it and a correct reason. But anything, like I say, from 10,000 and you could borrow right up to 10 million. What are the typical kind of loans to value that you see? So, you know, if, if someone came to you and said, I've got a 200 grand property, and actually, I'd like to release as much as possible because I don't know whether it be through the mortgage size or combination of, of, of debts, banker, mom and dad, whatever, holiday home, don't know. But if they came to you and said, I want to try and get the maximum amount, as well as your advice in terms of what would be reasonable, what, what, where are the lenders pitching generally their kind of loan to value in this? I guess anywhere between the lowest loan to value is if the client doesn't require um, anywhere near, you know, the maximums. But it, typically speaking, the maximums in the marketplace at the moment are around about 58% loan to value against the property. So if we take a, a simple example of 100,000, client could borrow, you know, up to 58,000 in theory, but it does depend on the client's age. That would be someone in, in their 80s, for example. Um, and we're not suggesting that somebody goes out and borrows the maximum, the, the they would have to have a reason or a shopping list, if you like, that they're going to use within the next 12 months um, to decide on how much we were going to recommend they borrowed and for obvious reasons, because there's no point of borrowing money that you're not going to be using in the future. There, there, there are products out there where a client can borrow a certain amount now and then have access to further funds in the future called a cash reserve or drawdown facility. And the beauty of that being is that they wouldn't be paying any interest on that cash reserve. Only if they decide to use it would they start paying any interest and draw down on it. And the benefit being, obviously, it's saving the estate money and the client isn't borrowing more than they actually need at that point, Sean. But loan to value, back to the original point, it's up to about 58%. Um, but one little caveat I would add, when people are starting to borrow the absolute maximum, the rate doesn't go up sort of evenly if you like once you get to them highest and the very highest loan of values the rate will tend to go up exponentially because the risk is higher to the lender for obvious reasons um but there are products throughout the industry that will you know allow people to borrow the maximums and there could be a reason for doing that sean as you mentioned earlier it could be someone who needs to clear an interest only mortgage and in, you know they don't want to move out the home they've got no choice the lender probably wants their money back because it's come to the end of the term. We see this quite a lot. They've took a mortgage out on an interest only basis 15, 20 years ago. The lender wants the money back. Could be the high street lenders as well. There's still a lot of those people that are trapped as mortgage prisoners. Now it could be that they want to borrow the maximum so that they can remain in the property and clear the lender rather than it be repossessed or haven't sell the property. There's an example when somebody may wish to borrow the maximum, but there's got to be a good reason. Spot on that. I didn't know about the cash reserve facilities or options, and that, that's—I mean—that just seems sensible all round, doesn't it? As, as, as potentially as an option in the right circumstances. You know, that to me, that seems very fair. And and again, you know, just 
common sense, but I wasn't aware that that kind of a facility, you know, existed. Um, you were just answering it there, so so I think we know what the answer is. But a couple of questions: Can I take out equity release if I have an outstanding mortgage? Yes, absolutely. Um, the the outstanding mortgage needs to be cleared as simultaneously on the completion of the equity release, so they have first charge on the property. Um, but yes, and just as we mentioned that example there, the, the, you know, a great deal of people at the moment are using equity release to repay their interest only mortgage that they took out, Sean. But you can do it at the same time, simultaneously, you can clear that and borrow extra funds if the equity's there and they wish to do so. And um, what are the most common reasons you see for it? And also, are there any reasons that would, would, would be a no? Would you know, almost like a restricted list or, or restricted examples? Mm. Um, I guess some of the main reasons are to clear an interest-only mortgage. And what I'm seeing more and more now is um, people release some money to give to family members, and that could be sons or daughters or grandchildren to help them on the property ladder or for, for other reasons, really. Um, it can be for consolidation, home improvements, lifetime holidays. I mean, the, the, the list is endless, really. Um, as long as it's for, a you know, obviously a legal purpose and it makes sense for the client to lend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, things that would stop it is, that, is things that would be, um, do you mean linked to the actual criteria of the lender? Yeah, I was interested in whether... You know, if you said, I want to do an equity release because this is what I want to do with the money, as an example, I was wondering whether it's a case of, look, you can do whatever you want with it, realistically, mm-hmm. as long as it works, as long as the criteria boxes are met, as long as whatever option you go for seems to be affordable and works for the lender and works for everyone, you do what you want with the money, or whether it's a case of going, well, this is what I want to do with the money, and it'd be like, mm, we're not comfortable lending if you're going to use it for that purpose, if you see what I mean. I do, I do, yeah, and that's a good point as well. Well, I'll be, I know the, a lot of the lenders and advisors should would be uncomfortable and are uncomfortable around if somebody would decided they wanted to raise money to invest in the stock market, for example, or even in a case where they want to raise money to um, buy other properties on a buy-to-let basis. Great care would have to be taken in in both cases, and certainly. It would be, I wouldn't recommend that anybody raises money by way of equity release to go and then invest in the stock market, for example. And when it comes to raising money to um, maybe for deposits for buy to lets, which I've heard of in the past, again, great care would have to be taken because the cost of borrowing um, would often outweigh the benefits they're going to receive on going into the buy to let marketplace. And I have had inquiries along those lines before. So those are a couple of examples when I don't think it's a good idea and it wouldn't be something I recommend. I know the lenders aren't comfortable with that either. Yeah. And what if I have, if I was doing it, what if I had other occupants in my property? You know, I live with, you know, live with my wife or I live with a partner or I live with children or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, if it's wife or partner, again, great care would have to be taken if because... I would always recommend that your wife or partner is added to the equity release and the, the deeds of the property because that way they would be afforded protection in the event of your, your, your spouse or your, you know your wife or husband dying. If the partner or wife wasn't part of the equity release, if that person who is on the equity release and the title passes away, then they could be left homeless in that situation. Um, it's very rare that it it would be a good idea for the partner not to be added to the equity release for that reason. You know, could be the other separate estate. I'm not saying I would never say never, but great care would have to be taken. I know that there's only two or three lenders in the marketplace now that would um, do a, an equity release for a, a clients who are married. Um, but only one is going to be added to the equity release. There'd have to be a good reason for that, Sean. Yeah. And are, are you still able to like leave an inheritance to your children? Is there any way of ring fencing any any of the asset within the property once once you've done equity release, or as you're doing it, I should say? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I forgot to answer the other part about other people in the property. Anyone else in the property, sorry, is over 18 um, or even 17, it's just before they're 18, but have to sign a, a waiver or consent form to say that they were aware that if the, per, the, the last survivor or the person the egg release passes away, they would they would have to find their own property, basically. They would become homeless. But yes, you can do that, even if other people are living with you. Um, I'm sorry, on to that next question, Sean. My apologies there. Yeah. No, it's cool. So on the, on the inheritance point, I can just, hypothetically, I would go to do equity releases and still leave inheritance for my kids. And I can, is, is there any way of actually ring fencing that? Or is there a risk that the inheritance, I want to leave my kids, even for sake in the equity release, could be hoovered up by the lender in that mm-hmm. situation? It's it, in, a, in a the answer to the question is yes, you can ring fence um, part of the equity as an inheritance for your children. Um, in effect, that would reduce the amount you could access yourself personally, but in larger value properties, etc., it's often a good idea to protect some of the equity for this for the, the interests of your beneficiaries. Um, the equity could be used up uh, or hoovered up by the lender for want of a better word, but only in a sense that, let's say, for example, simple terms is a property worth 100,000. Someone borrowed 40,000 on a lifetime mortgage by way of equity release. Let's say that that person lives another 20, 25 years. They don't make any payments towards the interest or capital. So the, the interest rolls up to a level, let's say it rolls up to, 75 or 80,000 pound within that time there's been a, a a correction or a housing crash like we experienced in 2007 2008 so it could be that there's actually more outstanding than the property's actually worth in that case there's going to be nothing left for your estate for your beneficiaries um however there is another good feature built in um with the equity release council guidelines and the lenders now where there's they've got to have a no negative equity guarantee in place which means if that scenario happened that we've just described then the lender would have to absorb the loss there would be no debt added to the estate or the beneficiaries and the people would still be able to remain in the property for life anyway even if there was negative equity generated because of those market conditions in that example Mm. Yeah, so in, in, in a normal situation with normal circumstances, it, it, there's going to be some equity in the property to still form part of the inheritance to children, family members, friends, whatever it might be. And like you've said, there would have to be a very, I hate the word perfect storm, because obviously that, you know, it's, it's, it's a poor phrase to an extent, yeah. isn't it? But you would need a terrible set of circumstances to combine. And even then, the estate's not got any exposure. So it's not like your kids have got a foot of bill or anything. Yeah. Um, but for, for that equity to be eroded for the estate, there would have to be a, a highly unlikely, but I suppose hypothetical set of circumstances that could apply. Mm. Um, would, would, say, my entitlement to means-tested benefits be affected by doing equity relief? Possibly, yes. If somebody's on um, means test of benefits such as council tax reduction or pension credit, then generating a large sum of capital to send to that client or to use could, you know, could wipe out somebody's entitlement to means test of benefits. So again, great care has got to be taken when given that advice and recommendation. Um, and I would always recommend that a benefits calculation is done as part of the advice to ensure that it doesn't impact those benefits. Um, that doesn't mean somebody can't borrow in that situation. And it doesn't mean that they will lose the benefits because we can keep the capital down to a level um, where it doesn't impact means tested benefits. And we can also place money into drawdown. So there's some other funds there to be used as and when needed so that we're not taking all that money out at once for obvious reasons. Um, and also a person is entitled to borrow money to do home repairs or improvements, et cetera, um, for essential purposes. And again, without infecting, without affecting their entitlement to benefits, would always recommend checking with either the Citizens Advice, Age UK or the DWP as well, because we're not experts in 
benefits. It's a very, very complex system. Um, what I would do as part of the process, we always do a benefits uh, calculation and check to ensure that it isn't going to impact the benefits. And if it is that the client's aware of that, and there'd have to be a really good reason to ignore that, if you like, and to, to go ahead with the recommendation anyway. Yeah. Can you pay equity release back early? And if you can, what's the consequences of paying it back early? Yes, you can pay it early. Um, more often than not, there would be an early repayment charge as well as part of it, but you could clear it early, yes. And it varies very, very differently from each lender and product. It can be anything up to 25% of the amount borrowed if you decide to clear it early of your own accord. Um, I would add that that would only apply if none of the events had happened. Somebody just decided they want to sell and move abroad or move into rented accommodation or they just didn't want it anymore, they came into money, then the chances are an early redemption charge would apply. And it could be anything between 25% of the amount they borrowed, that's a maximum. And it could be it could be zero. There might not be an early redemption charge, depending on the terms and depending on whether they decided they wanted to clear it. Yeah. So worth checking that out first, of course, before anyone Absolutely. gets in a rush to start transferring funds. Totally. And that's, you know, that that's something that you, as an advisor, you've got to take into account when recommending a specific product. If there's going to be an event in the future or a, an event in the future and it's likely to happen where they can clear it in full, then we we you would look towards a product that had minimum early redemption charges or zero at some point in the future when the event happens, yeah. So most people doing equity release will have been really experienced in having a mortgage, I imagine. They may have gone through the full term of it or like we've referenced, sort of discharge the mortgage towards the end, potentially the term. So once they've got their equity release product, whether it's because the house has gone up in value or maybe it's because there might be bad rates, as an example, like like mm-hmm. this year, people might have been thinking, okay, maybe, maybe there's a better deal out there. Can you almost remortgage the equity release to another equity release product or is it very much once you've done it once, that's it, you're sort of tied in? I mean, it is a lifetime product. It is designed to last for life. However, there are there are lots of circumstances where you could refinance it. It could be um, one of the legacy products we touched on at the beginning of the podcast where it could be um, a variable or extremely high rate. I've seen some as high as 7 and 8% and that is compounding. Some of these products might not have an early redemption charge, so you could refinance that. You could It's classed as you know, what's commonly known as a, to, to re-broke the original product. You could save the client and the estate you know, substantial amounts of money. I've done that several times, but we'd have to do an analysis to make sure that the new product is going to benefit them. And we'd have to take into account the setup costs for the new product. Yeah, which would, you know, be advice fee, could be valuation, um, and certainly the legal costs as well. So all this would have to be factored in. But yes, it is possible. And yes, it can be, you know, a really good thing to do in certain circumstances. Yeah. And what happens if you enter long-term care um, whilst on equity release? Sure. If it's um, if it's a joint equity release, husband and wife, for example, and husband enters long-term care, then the wife is still entitled to stay in the property until she passed away or moved into long-term care herself. So you've always got that protection. That's why if, if the two people, the spouse or the husband and wife, both on the equity release, it's always based on the last survivor or the last person moving into long-term healthcare. When that happens, if they've both moved into long-term healthcare or it's only one person, then the house, um, the lender wants their money back. That's a trigger point, really. One of the two um, reasons where the, the lender will want the money back at that point. So typically the client themselves or the attorney if they've lost capacity and gone into care would be expected to sell the property within 12 months and the lender will get their money back anything whatever's left within the sale after the lenders received their funds would then go to their estate beneficiaries as planned or it could go towards obviously the care depending on the circumstances of the client yeah how reasonable 
if you like, are the lenders when that event happens. So either both, say for instance, sake, you could be could be your mum and dad as an example. Of people might be worried about what their kids would have to do in mm. terms of, you know, they both entered care or or sadly passed away. Mm. Lenders want the money. How much? In there are the either the the people getting the inheritance are going to potentially want to remortgage potentially if that's what they want to do or more commonly i guess sell the property sure. what kind of time frame do you would you tend to expect in that you know are the, are the lenders quite laid back about it and flexible do they turn around and say look you got 12 months it, yeah. how does that element of it work yeah i mean i've had i have had experience with this when um clients have got back in touch with me or the, the family of clients have got back in touch um yeah i tend to find the lenders are very supportive and very reasonable and that's why there's a it's not a case of them taking over the sale of the property or repossessing the property when one of the events happens, either the last person in long-term care or, or, or death. Um, they're quite happy to let the executors or the client deal with the sale of the property. And that, I guess, 12, that 12 month window that they, they get to do that before the lender would have the right to step in is to protect the lender in those circumstances as well, because, I guess to give an example, or if if the family really didn't want to sell the home, but the original clients aren't in it, then you know they could, um, they, there could be a price that's it's put in place, or it could be an unrealistic valuation that's on the property, um, you know, and then the lender would then obviously be left where they they're not going to have the money money back within the twelve months. So this gives them the right to step in and assist. The family in selling it or, or or otherwise at that point so in my experience definitely they've been very supportive yeah and how much does equity release cost like what are the what what fees so i mean i suppose what are the title of the fees what kind of fees are charged and then you know what's your kind of estimate for kind of how much those things amount to it varies a great deal and whether a broker's hall of market or tide um the, there's usually an advice fee levy, sometimes an application fee from some brokers, but there's usually an advice or completion fee. And that I've seen that range anywhere um, between 295 up to £2,000 as a completion fee for the advice itself, which goes to the broker. There could be a valuation fee, although this is very rare. The vast majority of lenders... Um, they pay for the valuation, the basic valuation itself for lending purposes. Um, and the other fee, there could be a product fee for the actual lender itself. But again, these aren't particularly um, common now. There's the, the majority of lenders have products where there's no product fee added. But that could be anything up to about 895 or £1,000. So in total, I guess if you look at an advice fee, um, I would say a typical fee in the marketplace is probably about between a thousand and fifteen hundred. A product fee, if there is one, which is maybe around you know eight or nine hundred pounds as uh, as an outside guess. And then you've got your legal costs, and the legal costs, I would say a ballpark figure including VAT and a home visit, um, or an office visit, depending on what the client wishes to do. I'd say it's an average of about the eleven or twelve hundred pounds for the legal costs. So all in all, you may be looking at costs anything ranging really between about twelve hundred pounds up to about you know three and a half thousand pounds, depending on the product and the company and the broker. Yeah. Yeah, just on the subject of the legals, I would I'd recommend that people who are looking to do equity release, it's well worth getting a copy of your deeds dug out soon. If you're looking to do that, and because you know any potential, I don't know, like restrictions on there or lease hold matters, um, solar panels can sometimes be an issue that could incur extra cost. Um, generally, all stuff you can overcome, but there might be an extra, I don't know, 100, 200, even sometimes 300 pound plus VAT charge by a law firm for situations like that. And as you referenced correctly before, you know, if you've got another. You know, adult occupier in the house, commonly children over 17, 18, like you referenced. I suppose they're not children anymore, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. The 
the I mean the study children on the but the young adults in, a, in a, at that time, you know, they would need to sign various waivers, like you say, and they would obviously need trapping, but again, we tend to be sort of additional charges in, in hundreds each rather than anything particularly substantial. And they would those fees would come out of the equity release as such. So it's not like they'd have to have the liquid cash to pay the legal fees generally. The lawyers would take the, the lump sum and then retain their fee generally in that situation. Um, what are the most common problems, Steve? You were saying before, you know, um, I don't like having to deliver bad news. So what are the most common reasons for either you rejecting it or or the or, or and or significant delays with lenders? Like what are the most common problems that come up during the process? Mm-hmm. I guess the the from an advice point of view, if a client was wanting to um, access equity release quite a large sum of money, but they had they had quite a large sum of money already in the bank or they had access to, to funds, then you you know, I would always say, well, there's no point of borrowing money you're going to pay interest on when you have the money that you need to use. Um, so that's one of the reasons that you would sort of reject it from an advice point of view. Um, from a lender point of view, I guess if the properties of it's not of standard construction, it could be steel frame or a single skin property. So it might not be suitable for lending criteria. Um, another reason is if there's commercial properties adjacent or very nearby or hotels, some lenders will reject it on that basis. Um, other, as you touched upon is um, if it's solar panels and they are leased to the clients um, some lenders aren't keen on doing that. Some may reject it for that reason, depending on the terms. But it does take a lot longer in that situation. And another really big one, which I've come across many times, when the, the lease itself, um, it could be a flat or even some houses when the lease terms aren't particularly favourable and it's got to be extended. If it's not for a certain length of time, that can that can be a short stopper completely. Yeah. And if people would like to get in touch with you, Steve, and, and get advice or, or reach out to you and, and mm-hmm. family, friends, or even themselves, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you, mate? Um, probably the best way would be email, um, steve at laterlife-money.co.uk, or you could Google the company name or myself and then, you know, drop me an email over that way. Absolutely more than happy to have a chat with anybody with, you know, no obligation, no cost. You know, more often I deal with people. Or you could even you could even give me a call. And the, probably the best number would be either the office number, which is on the website, or my mobile number, which is always on there. Quite happy to take a call. If I'm not busy, I'll always pick up. Thanks, Steve. I'll put all your um I'll put all the link. We'll be putting all the links in the links to the show so if you listen to this on a podcast it'll be in the, in the podcast links if you click on the more option and obviously on youtube it'll be in the links to the show beneath um that's it for the equity release show steve thanks for being such a fantastic guest thank absolutely you. brilliant content and information there mate so thank you thank you sean thanks for giving me the opportunity really appreciate it no problem. Please share and spread the word about the MRC show. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please hit us with a five-star review. And remember to check out the products and services at Later Life Money and also with your legals at mylegalclub.co.uk. But more importantly, please stay well and take care.